I am Dr. Julianne Scott Pollock. I am a performance ethnographer. This is a performance ethnographic production. It's a story of raising four boys and a girl, and also being a narrative and ethnographic researcher, fascinated by what it means to live in one's body. This story includes encounters in my family, as well as interviews that I conducted with people who live with seizures, live with anxiety, and who identify as gender expansive. Every person in the story will be played by a student in COM 495, Applied Cultural Performance. In this moment, someone will be playing me. As well as every person that I interviewed. Everyone who was cast was not cast because they looked or sounded like a particular person. They were cast because they could empathize with the experience. They could embody the emotion <coughs> and connect that person's story to an audience. They're not going to wear costumes because I want that reminder that these are people that have been trusted with other people's stories. The person I trusted with my story is named Grayson. I am honored to hand my story off to her for this evening. <laughs> The seven Scott Pollocks each set their designated seats around the long slab wood table made from a tree that they lost during Hurricane Florence in 2018. Except Rosalie, who sits in Julianne's lap, Evan rolls Nico's bean and rice burrito, and Julianne is worried. My next book is becoming a reality instead of an idea. Two publishers are already interested. I need to check in one more time before I continue writing. Do we want to reveal our family's cultural swim to the world? There's still time to stop, turn back, change course. Boys, I'm writing this book about our family and the people that I interviewed who are gender expansive and the people who live with seizure disorders. Are you all sure you're okay with being in the book? Remember, once it's published, anyone can read it. Yeah, it was my idea to write it, remember? So that people could understand. We want lots of people to understand. It'll make it easier for us if more people understand and a show at UNCW, too, for people who don't like long books. Yeah, don't just do a book. I know, I just wanted to make sure. Are you all sure? I still want a whole chapter with my name on it. Me too. Theo, your chapter doesn't come until after right, mine. We're doing littlest to biggest, right, Mama? That's what I was thinking. Your chapter will be after Vinny's and then Theo's. Mom, you seem nervous. Do you not want to write this book? I do, it's just you're all still so little. I'm worried that maybe you can't decide yet if you want me to write our story for everyone. <coughs> Mom, we asked you to write it. You're good at making people understand things, and we want people to understand. Once people understand, then they don't care what I dress like. Your book will help lots of people understand and then be okay. Mom, you keep asking us, and we're in it, but it's your story too. I tell stories to people even though you're in them. Just tell your story of being with us, besides. I'd rather have you tell my story than have to explain it myself. You're good at explaining things. He's right. I am the only one who enjoys writing, explaining, and advocating. It's who I am. I'm an ethnographer and a narrative researcher. So I interviewed 56 other people who live with seizure disorders and or are gender expansive. A portion also live with anxiety. This performance is a glimpse of race, education, gender identity, and socioeconomic socio status swirling, mixing, pulling, and splashing across different boundaries with the unpredictability of the ocean's currents just eight minutes from our home. The ocean's flows, patterns, and rhythms help us understand our identities across cultural spaces. 
as the sea shapes the edges of our beaches and conditions the bodies of swimmers in varying ways, education, medicine, and recreational areas serve as different challenges and opportunities. Our sons have grown up close to the ocean. They love it, fear it, find it frustrating, exhilarating, healing, and painful. Together, we become a family of cultural swimmers, conscious of others in the waters around us with varying experiences. We swim knowing that body bodies not marked by white middle-class privilege swim through life with less, sa less safety. The dangers they encounter are more persistent and the precautions less reliable. The luxury of a dominant identity is not available to them as it is to us. As we use our experiences swimming through the ocean to understand our identities and lived experiences, we understand that our stories are not only our own, but also the stories of cultural location. This performance is about a family of swimmers and the swimmers around us who help us understand the complexity of cultural waters. Of Tony, bold, strong swimmer, thrown off balance by the undertow of dominant masculinity. Of Vinny, our cautious and careful swimmer, avoiding waters he knows are dangerous, keeping his strokes as controlled as possible. Of Nico, our anxious swimmer who treads water betwixt and between the gender currents. Of Theo, who already seeks out rough masculine waters that exhaust him. And Rosalie, already experiencing the confines of the roped waters of femininity before she even knows what swimming is. Tony's guidance counselor. I know, what's up? We need to talk about Tony. I just had an intervention meeting between Marcus Baddies and him. Again? Again. Things got, well, intense during Gaga Ball. Gaga Ball is the new, safer version of recess dodgeball. Students stand in a sand pit with high wooden walls as they hit the ball at each other's legs with their hands. If hit below the knee, you are out. If hit above the knee, the person who hit the ball is out. Yeah, Tony's been saying he's been struggling. I think the issue is, well, you know how big he is. He's just so big and so strong. So I think when he gets upset, he's just intimidating for them in ways that he wouldn't be if he wasn't so big. And Marcus and Thaddeus rile him up. He gets overwhelmed when they yell at everyone to gang up on him to get him out. He gets so upset. He's not just angry. He's just so big and so strong. The little ones have to rally together to have any chance of beating him. You have to understand. I understand why they are compelled to do it, but they don't have to. He's still little. They just want to get the big kid out first. But he's 10 and he's having five seizures a day. He doesn't have a lot of emotional energy right now. He needs to find it, ma'am. I know. Look, just make sure you're talking to all the boys in the Gaga pit, okay? Tom is helpful to Tony. I wish he was in the meeting. It ended on a good note today. That's it's good. The kid's like your son, ma'am. He's just so big and so strong. He's so articulate when he wants to be. Well, when he's able to be. Having seizures is hard for him. He's just so tired. I'm sure. His test scores are great, though. He just needs to remember how big of a kid he is compared to the others. As I spoke to people who live with seizures, gender identity, ability, and socioeconomic status swirled to the surface of their cultural swim. Just a few months after Tony turned two, he stopped suddenly, gritted his teeth, and raised his hands in the air. His face flushed. He held his breath for a few seconds and trembled. The first time, his parents were startled, but thought maybe he was about to trip and was catching his balance. That one seizure turned into 30 a day. He has focal motor seizures in his frontal lobe. He now takes four medicines twice a day and has a biggest nerve stimulator to block more, but some seizures still suffer. <coughs> one story came from a large man sitting behind his desk as a medical administrator. With his thick, his, his collared shirt didn't bun around his thick neck. With his large chest between us, he leaned forward, his thick hands stretched with intensity. Julianne's instinct was to lean back, not forward during this interview. She gave him the audio recorder to speak into, rather than holding it for him. The distance she desired foreshadowed his message. So, I have what they call frontal lobe epilepsy. Typically, they happen if I'm extremely tired or I'm extremely stressed out. They usually occur either right as I'm going to sleep or right as I'm waking up in the morning. Or like I said, if I'm to the point where I'm just exhausted, then they happen. 
the last two seizure episodes that I had, I know because they were witnessed, uh, I had basically right after I had gotten out of bed in the morning and I had full grand mal type seizures. I lasted anywhere from a minute to two minutes with a pretty significant post seizure state where I come out of it and I'm basically just pissed off at the world. So the last time that it happened, I broke a number of things in my house and my partner at the time, well, my fiance at the time, I called 911 and I knew the people who had showed up. There were other healthcare providers. I had a pretty poor opinion of them and I had no problem voicing that to them at the time and basically telling them to exit my house in a very colorful language and basically explaining to them my assessment of their quality as healthcare providers. Which is not something I would normally do, but that filter, that filter just wasn't there. So the fiance in that story is not my fiance anymore. I'm with someone new. And you should know that with frontal lobe epilepsy, it's the part of our brain that processes all our feelings and all our emotions. So those of us with frontal lobe epilepsy are gonna be more intense, more extreme, and more emotional. That part of our brain is always overfiring, even on meds, even when our seizures are suppressed. And that has to be okay for the people who want to be close to us, for the people who want to love us. Our brains are firing more, and that means we are more. You have to be up for that. Not a lot of people are. Some people are, though. You just have to decide if you're one of those people or not. I'm okay with it, and I'm up for it. I see the handfuls of meds Tony takes, and I feel how the house shakes as he falls out of bed from seizures at night. But as, as I buckle under his weight, which I can no longer physically support, I am frightened of the weight of him managing his emotions in a haze of beds in a world where he's taught that men show anger, not vulnerability, when overwhelmed. And other kids feel powerful when reducing the biggest, strongest boy in the gaga pit to tears. How do I parent this big, strong, sensitive, exhausted boy with seizures in the culture we're in with the body he has? Brian gave some insights. Julianne and Brian spoke via Zoom during COVID. Large picture windows created a shadowed figure. His shoulders and jaw were broad. She again leaned back from him in her home office chair. She felt vulnerable in his presence despite their connection only being virtual. Brian's story is focused on having epilepsy as a large man. When you're a big, big guy who is always exhausted, and on edge, and agitated, and disoriented from seizing, people don't want to hug you. They're particularly not worried about you. They're scared for them. Big guys who don't seem totally in control are scary. Or well, maybe sometimes people can be assholes. Sometimes people just want to needle the big guy who's on edge, make him break down, lash out, lose his credibility. And you don't want to think that's it, but sometimes human nature just sucks. So I play old man softball. When you get to be my age, it's not baseball anymore. And there's this one guy, little guy, short, like 5'4 short. And every time I make any kind of mistake, he calls me on it. He heckles me. So I give him this look, and he's all like, whoa, whoa, I was just kidding around. Calm down. But this one time, I had just got out. It happens in softball. That's what the fucking game's about. And He's saying whatever he said, I can't remember exactly, but something about the big guy hits far but never moves his ass. So as I walk past him, I just bump his shoulder. He went flying, and he's all like, did you see that? Calm down. And now everyone's giving me this sort of raised eyebrow look, and I'm like, yeah, I bumped his shoulder, and yeah, I did it on purpose. I'm tired. The meds are off. I'm seizing all night. I'm sick of them. But I know those raised eyebrows mean judgment. That I'm scary. That I'm out of control. But he should leave me alone, you know? As I spoke to men across these interviews, I was continually reminded that part of the weight bearing down on Tony as he swims through life with seizures comes from being a big, strong boy. 
The UF5 is also a big and strong boy. He looks like and is built like his father with long, lean limbs and broad shoulders. He was born with a hero swagger and a competitive spirit. In his backyard, he likes to defend his family from the imaginary bad guys that he sees clearly enough to skillfully fight with his foam sword. He tells his little sister he will protect her and save her from all the bears and the monsters. He is fast, strong, and just so tired of the weight placed on the shoulders of a masculine protector. I still remember what I witnessed from the sidelines of four-year-old YMCA soccer game, watching the game and trying not to meddle. Theo's coach bends down towards him. Hey, there's my little dominator. This team's bigger than us, but you sure know how to score goals. And for a while, Theo was able to outrun the five-year-olds on the team above him, but as he grew tired, his face crumbled in frustration. I don't want to play anymore. I'm taking a brace. Come on, Theo. We need you out there. Okay. A bigger boy took the ball from Theo about halfway down the field. Theo chased after him with his arms out as he attempted to steal the ball. Hey, hey, no pushing. Theo stopped and started to cry and ran to his parents at the edge of the field. He said he wanted a break. Listen to him. That story was frustrating for Theo, but after a snack and some blue Gatorade, he was happy again. He high-fived his friends at the end of the game and moved on. Theo's athletic swagger, resilience, and move through life reminded me of Jed. Jed was athletic, strong, fit, and approachable. He just finished an MBA and works in marketing for a firm filled with men with similar aesthetics that bike and hike together on the weekends. As Julianne walked into the open office to interview him over his lunch, he gestured over with a big grin. He wore a white button-up shirt made of heavy canvas, faded jeans, and green Converse sneakers. So there was this one time that I broke my granddad's two ribs because he was trying to hold me still and he thought that I was just jumping around. There was this other time and this one's actually kind of funny. At our undergrad convocation, I attacked the university president and knocked over like 900 diplomas that were stacked next to him. So there's this 75-year-old man, and he's getting up there at the convocation, and he's welcoming everybody. And me, being the student body president, I'm sitting here on the front row of the stage. And I get up. Basically, I have a seizure, and I pretty much attack him. I put my arms around him and just start jumping and jerking, and the diplomas went flying. I sit down, and this congressman gives me this look, like that he thought I was possessed, that my seizures were completely out of control. People thought that there was some rhyme or reason as to how they came about, but there just wasn't. And that was frustrating, and also difficult when every decision I made was contingent on how having a seizure could impact that choice. Like, should I drive this car, or should I get into that pool, or should I go out with that really pretty girl from my class? Or should I drink this can of Mountain Dew Code Red? Anything and everything I did was centered on the fact that at any moment, I could lose consciousness, wet my pants, and perform violent actions with my body. There was this one time that I took my pants off while I was riding around in a girl's car, and I took off running into the road. And people were like, oh, you know, that's Jed. He has seizures for attention. For attention? It wasn't for attention. It doesn't happen anymore, though. A couple of students from my undergrad put together a fundraiser for an experimental brain surgery. Donations came flooding in. We raised $18,500 for my surgery. That was the entire copay. They removed the part of my brain that was causing the seizures. That's something I'll never be able to pay back over the course of my entire life. Tony is currently a potential candidate for Jed surgery. He's deeply excited, nervous, and hoping not to be disappointed. His classroom organized a large gift basket with games and snacks, and his friends will drive for two hours to see him at the hospital. The multi-step surgeries are covered by our insurance, and we can afford the co-pays. White, male, middle class, athletic, and strong. Like Jed, Tony is connected with financial and social resources for life-altering surgery to make his swim easier. Julianne went to see Cassie in the living room of her trailer. The kitchen and living room were clean but cluttered. The blue carpet was freshly vacuumed and worn through in some places. 
Julianne sat next to Cassie on a tan corduroy couch to hear her story. Cassie made eye contact nervously in navy leggings, a green oversized t-shirt, her black hair in thick braids, and shimmery makeup on her large, dark eyes. Cassie seemed tentative. She clasped her fingers in her laps and looked down as she spoke. I mean, yeah, I have seizures. I've had them since I was little. I don't remember how little, but you know, little. So little I don't remember when they started. I don't have insurance. My parents never had insurance. They work hourly jobs. They were self-employed. My dad fixes houses and my mom cleans them. So yeah, I don't know what kind, but the usual kind. I black out and I shake all over. My ex said I flop like a fish and I drool a lot. He was an asshole. I don't know. I'm sick for like, I'm really sick after. I'm sick for like <laughs> days after. I mean, I can't hold down a job. They fire me because I can't come in. I mean, my head just pounds and I can't open my eyes. And I just live with it, you know? I mean, I can't really afford to see anyone. I mean, I just live with it. Besides, I don't want to be on any of that. I don't want to take anything for it. People act weird around you when you take that brain stuff. Once I did mention it to this doctor in the ER, I thought I was there because I had broken my foot and I thought he should know even though I had never been to a doctor for it. So then he started asking me all these questions and he ordered this EEG and this MRI and they saw nothing. And they were like so expensive. And they said, you can't have epilepsy if they don't see anything. So then they started asking me all these questions like maybe I was saying it to get on drugs or something. So I don't even mention it anymore. During Cassie's story, my body tensed at the exposure of the systematic injustice my white middle class body with good health insurance had never encountered so closely. As her shoulders drooped, mine grew more rigid. As a critical scholar, I felt the dangerous intersecting currents of marginalization weighing down on her, making her swim through life impossible. The tides of classism, sexism, and racism making the tides of ableism impossible. As a mother, I immediately wondered what her life would have been like if she were mine. If with my health insurance, my education, my flexible work schedule, my middle classness, my whiteness, if I could have held her and swam against the currents to waters that were safe, supported. I asked if she needed an advocate, if she'd like me to go to the doctor with her, but she firmly declined. She had found a way to navigate the waters that she was in and did not trust other paths or those who had no experience with her swim. Bodies like mine had not helped her up before and it was not worth the risk of swimming with a stranger. She died in her sleep of SUDEP, sudden unexplained death from epilepsy, two months after we spoke. The cultural waters are dangerous for some bodies. Without, Without support, support, some drown. drown. The support of family with financial resources drastically changes our cultural swim. We're at Disney World. It's hot. We're on an impromptu trip to Florida in mid-September after being displaced from Wilmington as Hurricane Florence ravages the North Carolina coast. My brother, who lives outside of Tampa, wants to help but does not want our four children staying in his mansion with a million dollars worth of painting glass art. So he sent us to Disney World to ride out the storm. We're happy to be here, but we packed quickly and haphazardly as we sought to get out of the city before they shut down the streets in preparation for the storm. We arrived last night and spent the evening swimming and eating tacos poolside at the Beach Club Resort on Disney property. We woke up early in order to be the first ones at the gate since we booked our trip too late to secure fast passes for the newest attractions. Tony is seven and walks ahead with Evan. Vinny is a few weeks from five and holds Julianne's hand. Nico is two and in Evan's arms, and Theo is eight weeks old and curled against Julianne's body in a soft strap-on carrier. They just got off the frozen ride at Epcot, and everyone is excited as they exit through the frozen-themed gift shop, mildly wet from the splashes from the boat. 
Finney sees the hanging turquoise blue Elsa dress that is more realistic than the knockoffs Evan found on Amazon. He stops and stares at it. They were here eight months ago, and he opted not to buy the dress despite his parents' offer to do so. He's more adventurous his second swim through this cultural space in less than a year. Julianne follows his gaze to the dress and looks back down at him. Do you want to try it on? Julianne finds his size, and they head to the log cabin door of the dressing room. Vinny, do you want to wear it out of the park? Lots of kids wear their dresses in parks. Everyone does here. It's up to you. Will people say anything to me? I don't know. I bet they'll say that you look beautiful. Turquoise is gorgeous on you. It looks nice with your dark eyes. I really want to. Okay, let's go. Can I get these shoes to go with it, too? Vinny looks up at the matching shoes hanging on the wall. Sure, but that's all your spending money for the day. Are you sure you want to spend it all on your first day? Yeah, this is the only store I want to go into. Okay, let's go. Julianne follows Vinny to the checkout line where he places the shoes on the counter with both hands and stares up at the cashier with wide, careful eyes. She is wearing a long skirt and an embroidered vest to resemble a villager from the fictional Scandinavian country of Arendelle where Frozen takes place. She comes around to the front of the register to snip the tags off to the dress to bring it up. Do you also want me to take these off the hanger for you? Can we? Sure, we'll take them now. Vinny kicks off his hot pink sneakers and peels his socks off his already sweaty feet. He slips into the sparkly jelly shoes with light up heels and stamps a few times. They, they fit, fit, don't, don't pinch, and, and are not, not falling off. off. Can we get the back for the other clothes, please? <clears throat> of course. Your daughter looks just like you. She's beautiful. Vinny is smiling. I decide not to correct her. We leave the store hand in hand and see the rest of the family standing in a circle showing each other their treasures from the gift shop. Nico and Tony shopped with Evan. Nico picked this out for Theo. That is a great dress and shoes. Are the shoes comfortable enough to walk around in? We still have a long day. Yeah, they feel good. Mama says if I want to put my sneakers back on, I can, but I won't. As long as your feet feel okay. <coughs> Finny's feet were fine. And after Disney World, he went shopping for dresses that twirled with soft leggings. He grew out his hair and pierced his ears. He's been our beautiful boy ever since. Thomas responded to a call for research participants that went out over Julianne's personal Instagram. Julianne sat across from him at a coffee shop he suggested they meet at. His long nails matched his powder blue hair that was below his shoulders. He wore a tight-fitted purple t-shirt with an abstract design and a black fishnet long sleeve underneath. His eyeliner was dark and dramatic for the mid-afternoon. He smiled over his matcha tea with carefully lined pink lips. Julianne liked him immediately. She wished that Vinny could see his hair and nails. Vinny has wanted to dye his hair blue for several years, but was worried about bleach damaging it and having to go short afterwards. He loves his long hair. Thomas's hair looks soft and healthy. Julianne made a note to ask him about where he got it done and how he keeps it so shiny. As soon as she turned her audio recorder on, he began talking. I'm actually really excited to talk to you. When I saw your call on social media, I searched your profile. <laughs> Stalker! I know. And I saw that picture of your son looking so proud of his Elsa dress. And I'll be honest, I'm being honest with you, I had tears in my eyes. I so wanted a bell dress, a bright yellow glittery bell dress. And my parents just said no. Like, absolutely no. And so I stuffed that desire down and was so sad. Because I couldn't make believe to be who I wanted to be. I didn't want to be Spider-Man, I wanted to be Belle. And imagine if I had just been able to do it. If I hadn't had to wait until college to try on my first dress. It was part of a drag show for Pride Week, and if that wasn't the first time I'd ever worn lipstick and eyeliner that I always knew I could rock, and I do, <laughs> my mom's like you. She wears gorgeous makeup. We could have had fun, like you have with Vinny. Imagine how amazing I could be if they just bought me that fucking dress at five like I fucking asked them to. What if my parents had been safe, you know? They wouldn't even let me buy purple boys' clothes. They were so scared of who I was, and it made me scared. I was scared for years, and I'll admit I'm still scared. Because hate is fucking scary, and I know in the wrong place, I could be killed. That's just how it is. I went to New York City for pride, and I changed out of my sequin crop top and shorts to get on the subway. You just don't know. But imagine if my parents were with me. My dad's a big, burly guy. People probably wouldn't want to mess with. If with them, I was safe. I saw your husband wear a tutu and fairy wings to trick-or-treat with Vinny with his big, bushy beard. Wow, what that could have done for me, if my dad did that. I don't know, so I'm going to follow your Instagram and just see. 
Maybe I'll see how it could have been. Sal's interview was over Zoom. He sat on a sapphire blue velvet couch in a white room with black <coughs> accents. He wore a deep green dress that contrasted well with his black skin. His shiny straight hair was skillfully sculpted across his forehead with long silver earrings that grazed his shoulders. He had a round face with large eyes and full lips. Well, let's get right into it. So I'm going to tell you a story of why I want to talk to you, why I decided to answer this call. My dad had this royal purple t-shirt, and I know royal purple may sound weird, it's usually royal blue, but this was royal purple with yellow writing on it. I don't know what it said, I was too young to read and didn't care, but it was just long enough that it switched around my ankles when I was three. And gosh, I loved it. And it was a man's shirt. So my mom and dad let me wear it at first because they thought, oh, he wants to be like daddy. Um, no, I did not. My dad was in construction, laying foundations, like the most masculine guy you ever met. I did not want to be like him. It would ruin my nails. <laughs> that shirt was the closest to a dress I could find that let me wear. And I loved skipping and twirling and dancing. And then one day, I guess they got why it made me so happy. And they said I was too big to wear daddy's t-shirts out of the house anymore. They wouldn't let me wear it outside, and then they wouldn't let me wear it at all. And it made me so sad. That's one of my earliest memories them taking that t-shirt away from me. After that, I was scared for them to see me. So I'd make dresses, or more like Grecian togas out of my bedspread, with the door closed. If they'd walk in, I'd just crumple into it like it was a failed fort or whatever. They never questioned. They never saw my bedspread dresses. And they missed out. I've always been fabulous. So I'm just so jealous when I see pictures of any. I would have loved to have been true to me, to be me, to be wearing dresses since the beginning. Of course, I mean, racism compounds it all. To be black and gender non-conforming is a double oppression, a double hatred from people. And, I mean, masculinity is different in the black community. Could you explain it to me? I mean, I feel like I don't have to. You get it. You know what racism is. But you want me to. For your research? If you don't mind. It's fine. I mean, masculinity is for survival for black men. To be tough. I mean, white people are scared of heteronormative black men. It means you're more likely to be killed, but it's also the power you have. But you'd use what you got. And I choose not to do that. I choose to be more feminine. I choose to be who I am. And that's almost like a betrayal of the power I have as a black man. Sal so was, was a complicated character, character for Julian Cast. Cast. She returned to discuss with him who he would like to play him, and he said, Anyone who gets racism. People tend to listen to white people better about racism. Cast someone like you, and maybe a white person talking about racism, We'll throw people off enough that they'll listen. Worth a try. While Vinny has a gender expansive swim that consistently embraces the feminine, Nico, with his long wavy hair, leggings and t-shirts and button-ups and bright sneakers, treads water in a seemingly non-binary space. He identifies as a boy and gets nervous when misgendered, although he doesn't correct anyone. He restricts himself to wearing dresses in places where he feels safe which is home, the Scott Pollock's Progressive Episcopalian Church, and places where he knows no one. His gender expansive swim is cautious. Doctors and counselors say he likely has anxiety, which will be formally diagnosed as he ages. This potential diagnosis is not surprising. It runs through his DNA. Hello, is this Nico's mom? Yes, that's me. I wanted to talk to you about Nico. He's so quiet. He never says anything. His test scores are so high. He's so smart, but he never speaks up at all. Yeah, Nico is more of an observer. I was wondering if we could send him to the guidance <coughs> counselor to work on interacting with other kids. We have a group for social skills. Maybe we could get him out of his shell? Sure, but I don't know if you'll change who Nico is. He's careful, and he prefers smaller groups for interactions. I don't mean to say that he needs to change. Well, you're sending him to a group designed to make him more outgoing. I don't mind if he goes. It's fine. I'm just saying you're describing how Nico is in big settings, and group is a big setting. Well, if you don't mind, I think it's best. I said I don't mind. And Nico went to the group. Nico is still smart, quiet, tentative, dressed in soft, bright colors with flowing waves, soft pants, bright, sparkly shirts, and pink sneakers, rather than the dresses and heels of Vinny's early elementary days. He sees leggings as pants, which is as close as he'll go to feminine style in places he isn't completely comfortable. Others Julianne interviewed spoke of the societal pressures they continue to face as gender expansive in adulthood. I wonder what the future will bring. 
if the emerging currents are more open, less constraining to cultural swims. Joey met with Julianne via Zoom. They ate lunch together, each in their offices with the door closed and the sun streaming through their windows, casting shadows across half of their faces. Joey wore a slim-fitted navy blue button-up shirt with a yellow bow tie. Her light brown hair was closely cropped to her head with speckles of silver. Julianne might have misgendered her had she not clarified in her email inquiry to join the study that she is a cisgender straight woman who is gender nonconforming. She leaned back in her office chair and began talking without prompting after clicking the consent to record the interview. Hi, it's good to see you. I love this study. Honestly, when I first saw it, I was like, finally, a study about me. So, I'm a cisgender woman and I'm married to a man and I'm gender nonconforming. Feminine style makes me so uncomfortable. I mean, it makes my skin crawl. I imagine my feelings of discomfort parallels the discomfort of homophobic men in dress. I mean, I don't know. It just really makes me that uncomfortable. It's more than a style preference. It's an identity for me. So, I'm a masculine woman, and my husband is fine. I mean, he identifies as straight, too. And I know that we look like a gay couple of people. I mean, it doesn't take much of a baggy shirt to hide my boobs. And I've always been like this. For the most part, my parents just called me a tomboy. I just wanted to be one of the boys, and that was adorable and fine, except I never grew out of it. And my mom sort of panicked when she thought that I was a lesbian. And I was so excited when I started dating my husband in college. She was so excited to plan the wedding. And that's, that's what I regret most. I let her convince me not to wear the suit that I'd picked out. It was her dream that as her only daughter, I wear a wedding dress. And so I did, and I hated it. I mean, I wore these white loafers with it, no makeup, no veil, no jewelry. I tried to be comfortable, I just couldn't. I hated it. I still won't look at those pictures. I want to put them up, I didn't put them out for anyone. I just am so mad at myself for giving in to my mom. I should have worn what I was comfortable in. And that's why I'm so glad that you don't do that. Make him wear what he doesn't want to. Don't ever, no matter how uncomfortable it makes you. I was just so uncomfortable that day. I wasn't me on the most important day of my life. Julianne met Clay for a drink while at an <coughs> academic conference on the West Coast. He chose a quaint pub with shiny dark wooden booths. Evening light cast a cool glow through the windows. He had long chestnut brown hair pulled back, large hazel eyes, and soft features. His collarbone jutted out beneath his electric blue and purple flannel. <coughs> his nails were short, shiny with a polish that looked clear until the light hit it to reveal a translucent, iridescent rainbow. His white cashmere scarf, deep purple puffer vest with slim jeans and hiking boots felt very Northwest in November. Polished, pretty, but not overstated. He clenched his jaw and continued to twirl vape pen between his fingers with what seemed like urgency. Hey, you made it. Whoa, you're very <coughs> pregnant. Did I make you walk too far? I'm sorry. I am pregnant, but I've been sitting through conference presentations all day so it's nice to get up and move. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. I'm so glad that was the time to meet. What can I say? The call intrigued me and made me nervous, like life in general. Um, I wasn't sure if I'm really who you're looking for. I mean, I guess I want to think of myself as gender non-conforming, gender expansive, or whatever, but it's not something I feel comfortable expressing outright. I mean, um, I guess I almost decided to do this so I had someone to talk about it with. I mean, I love to look beautiful. I'm drawn to femininity. I want to wear foundation and makeup. My eyes look better with liner. I use a light one you can't notice immediately. I hope you can. I didn't notice, but I do now. It's pretty. Thanks. It's hard because I feel like I should be able to just live my life. Wear what I want. Be a Harry Styles instead of making up my face and then scrubbing it off. Only wearing really feminine clothes in private. But I have this overwhelming sense of dread about it. And that's enough to get me to tone it down, to be right on the edge, to be masculine enough. Maybe that means I'm not actually non-conforming, expansive. I mean, ideally my girlfriend would be the same size as me, and we both share clothes. But I mean, that will never happen. I have anxiety. I take Celexa. I think it helps. And I vape. Drink to try to get it to go away when it gets super bad. And really that just makes me more anxious the next day, and bloated. And then, like, I lash out at people, or just can't even interact. I don't know. The ideal me is gender expansive and isn't anxious. But I mean, I don't know if people would even call me gender non-conforming. But I mean, I want to be. I'm gender non-conforming with anxiety that stops me from expressing who I am. Maybe it won't always be that way. I hope not. It's like that now, though. I hope that's worth your walk here. Do you have any questions? I have time.
At the close of the show, we wonder how the currents of culture will continue to shape performances of gender identity. How will the changing tides push and pull my boys as they navigate the intersecting currents of, marginal of white middle class masculinity, disability, and gender expansiveness? I question their futures. I also wonder what the world will be like for my two-year-old da daughter, Rosalie who from before she was born, people used words like sweet and beautiful to describe, despite her being as rough and tumble as her brothers. The currents of gender already shaping her swim before she could take her first breaths of air. We'll continue as we seek op open, calm waters where everyone can chart their own preferred swim.